Hosea chapter 11. Read through verse 1 of chapter 13. Hosea chapter 11, beginning at verse 12 through verse 1 of chapter 13. We're using the Bibles that are found under the seats. It's on page 758. Hosea chapter 11, beginning at verse 12 through verse 1 of chapter 13. Let us hear now the living word of our God. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies. And the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. The Lord has an indictment against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel, and in his manhood, he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He met God at Bethel, and there God spoke with us. The Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial name. So you, by the help of your God, return. Hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. A merchant in whose hands are false balances, he loves to oppress. Ephraim has said, ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. I will make, again, you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feast. I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions and through the prophets gave parables. If there is iniquity in Gilead, they shall surely come to nothing. In Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Their altars are also like stone heaps on the furrows of the field. Jacob fled to the land of Aram. There Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he guarded sheep. By a prophet the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt, and by a prophet he was guarded. Ephraim has given bitter provocation, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and will repay him for his disgraceful deeds. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel. But he incurred guilt through Baal and died. Shall we pray together? Lord our God, we pause now after hearing your word and and we would plead that you would grant to us minds that perceive and hearts that would not just know but would feel the wonders of your message to a wayward nation and and how that nation speaks yet to us and shows to us Christ. May you enable us to know the work that you've done that came before us upon those upon whose shoulders we stand, that we would not ever renounce your gracious work in leading us through all that has come before us, and we know that you will use what comes after. So may Christ be honored. May he be glorified this day through his word. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So right up front, I'm going to tell you that this is a difficult section of Hosea. It's difficult to understand in the way that it uh, flows. It's difficult to understand in many of its details that were given. And commentators, they struggle with the um, complexities and the translation issues that they're confronted with in, in this section. But despite those challenges and despite those difficulties that we see in this section, the message 
The basic message is clear. The historical reference we have to the forefather Jacob clues us in that we're still in the historical section of uh, Hosea as his preaching began with this look backward, this retrospective look that began in chapter 9, verse 10. And the theme revolves around a contrast between the historical Jacob, the patriarch Jacob, and what was present in Hosea's day, historic Israel, how she had arrived at the place where she was spiritually. You know, Jacob started out as a deceiver. He was a manipulator. He was a uh, conniver. And yet he was changed by an encounter with God. Now, the current national Jacob, the Jacob in Hosea's day, though they were in covenant with God, uh, and though they had many encounters with the living God, instead of being changed, the nation stayed a deceiver, a conniver, a manipulator, and a defrauding cheat. I mean, that's how Hosea sums up the whole nation. Now, we're looking at uh, this section, beginning at verse 12, and it goes through chapter uh, 13, verse 1. There are two major headings that we're going to look at in this section. And in the first one, what we see is that Hosea laments that Israel is filled with violence and lies. Israel is filled with violence and lies. In verse 12, the prophet says that the whole nation is filled with lies and deceit. That's what characterizes the nation. The whole nation has broken God's covenant. That would be the bond of faith and love and fidelity and, and commitment to Almighty God. Now, the other thing he says under this heading of violence and lies is that the people go after empty pursuits. Verse 1 of chapter 12, they feed on the wind and they pursue the east wind. And so these are things uh, that they just cannot get a hold of and yet they go after it. Now, some see Hosea introducing a contrast with Judah, who, even though Judah had her own issues and being faithful to the Lord, was still relatively faithful and walking with God, holding to the covenant and being faithful, as we see there in the latter part of verse 12, faithful to the Holy One. Others would translate this a bit differently as Judah, just like Israel, was unruly against the Lord. And so we have, it once again, the inclusion of Judah, even though Hosea is speaking mostly to the northern tribes of Israel, and Judah's included, and this more negative cast of Judah would seem to be more in line with what we find uh, in uh, verse 2 of chapter 12, the text that would, uh, excuse me, it would support a more positive view of Judah in this, in this uh, context. Now, what these two verses do is they set up a contrast with their forefather Jacob in these following verses, verses 2 through chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 13, verse 1. The patriarch Jacob, and though he started out a deceiver, and he was a swindler, and he's one who stole, uh, he was changed by God. He was changed to embrace uh, God's covenant. He came to see it as precious and as holy. So in the remainder of this section, verses 2 of chapter 12 through verse 1 of chapter 13, what we see here is that the Lord again indicts Israel for failing to learn from her history that she has seen in Jacob. Israel has failed to learn from her history. She should have known what God had done with Jacob and look to that covenant God to be one at work in their lives as well. Now, there are several points that Hosea draws as he develops this indictment. We don't have time to go into a deep or a very extended treatment of this, so just let, me, let me just give you just a, um, uh, an overview of this indictment, how it unfolds in these verses. Verse 2, Hosea announces 
there again, yet a further indictment that's against Judah and Israel. That is, here it's against the whole covenant community. That's why it does seem to be somewhat of a negative cast towards Judah as well. And then in verses 3 through 6, uh, Hosea references the patriarch Jacob, Israel's forefather. Notice he struggled with God, and he was chained by an encounter with God's presence. And one of the places that was marked out by Jacob because of that encounter was Bethel, meaning the house of God. That was the memorial site for the divine name by which God appeared to Jacob and what took place in his life. Now, presently, though, in Hosea's day, Bethel was anything but a holy place. A place it was a playground of Baal, a place of idolatry and shame. And then in verses 7 and 8, what we see here is the awful reality of Jacob's offspring in Israel. National Israel is still a cheater. They're not changed. Um, they're not any different than when they first began. They use false balances. They love to oppress, verse 7. And they think they actually brought about their own riches and wealth there in verse 8. They deny all the, in all of the things that they've done and all their labors that they've sinned. And then following this in verses 9 and 10, as they're boasting in their riches, they should have known that the Lord God was the one who prospered them. But now he is going to strip them of, her, of their wealth. Instead of their fine, luxurious homes, the Lord, there in verse 9, will again make them dwell in tents, like, like they were to do during the Feast of Tabernacles, the appointed feast. That's a time when, when God wanted Israel to remember her very humble beginnings. Well, now, boasting in their wealth, the Lord is going to reduce them back to that permanently, living in tents. Now, moving on, verse 11, Hosea marshals uh, two very stark pieces of evidence that Israel has just miserably broken faith with her God. Two cities are, are brought forth. Gilead and Gilgal, they're filled with iniquity, false, idolatrous worship. Terrible evidence that Hosea brings. And then after this, verses 12 and 13, Hosea goes back again to the patriarch Jacob. This great forefather learned covenant faithfulness. He learned it in the travails that he experienced uh, in the land of Aram, where Jacob met his match in his uncle Laban, who could outconnive, could outmanipulate, and outdeceive Jacob. And J there Jacob worked for a wife. And for a wife, he tended sheep, and he was tricked into doing that. And then finally, in verse 14 and verse 1 of chapter 13, Hosea, Hosea sets forth the outcome, the result of this indictment that the Lord brings. Ephraim, notice, he's, because he's given bitter provocation, in other words, there's been an aggravation of sin. The Lord now, verse 14, will repay him for his disgraceful deed. Ephraim, there was a time when they were an exalted people, as we see in verse 1 of chapter 13. But now by going after the false god Baal, he incurred guilt, and as a result, he died. He died to God. He would die in the judgment that would come as the Assyrians would sweep over the land. So over and over again, we have seen, have we not, Hosea preaching uh, these many negative, foreboding, uh, pointed sermons to the people cataloging, detailing their sin. Um, you know, I would suspect, wouldn't you, that whenever they, the people would see Hosea coming to one of their worship centers, worship sites, that they probably, uh, they'd probably begin to roll their eyes. You know, here comes that crazy preacher again. Uh, never says anything positive, just sin, sin, sin. Judgment, judgment, judgment. 
And in his sermons, are just getting really boring. But I also suspect that once those prophetic sermons started coming to pass, the people, and even those who made it through the uh, destruction, made it through the horrors of war, taken captive, deported, after looking back, they probably said, yep, <laughs> we thought he was just an angry, uh, obsessed, depressed preacher who couldn't keep his own family together, but you know, he was right. He was right. But by then, it was too late for Israel. Now, you'll notice that most of Hosea has been written in poetry. The modern versions that we have will show the, the poetic nature of this communication. But Hebrew poetry, the, ho the poetry that Hosea uses, not like the poetry that we're used to, uh, we think about. Uh, we mostly see it as rhyme, meter, and rhythm. Now, uh, Hebrew poetry did have rhyme, and it, or excuse me, it did have rhythm and meter, but it's a lot different than modern poetry. It wasn't rhyme so much. There might be, there might be words that would sound similar, but the main feature of Hebrew poetry was parallelism. Parallelism. Lines, uh, usually two lines, a couplet, sometimes three, a triplet, but they would either be synonymous, saying pretty much the same thing. We have an example of this in Mary's uh, Magnificat, where she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. From that synonymous parallelism, we see that soul and spirit are not two different entities, two different elements of the human person. They're just different ways of speaking about the non-material side of man. That would be synonymous. But there's also antithetical parallelism. If you read Proverbs, you see that all the time in the, in the book of Proverbs. There was a third kind. Uh, it was called synthetic parallelism. And that meant that in this building up of these uh, lines, it would add another element to the equation. Uh, to the previous statement. Now, I, I don't want to get into a boring discussion on poetry, uh, whether it's Hebrew or English, but just simply to give you an idea of why, why did God choose this kind of style for Hosea to deliver these very, these very dark, these very negative messages to the people. I mean, we need to understand that poetry, this kind of poetry, did many things. Uh, it aided memory. Uh, it, it, it highlighted important truths. One of the biggest things it did, it made the message so much more vivid. If I could maybe put it this way, it would be almost like a pre-modern motion picture with the, picture, with the images that would be drawn from this kind of literature, this kind of poetry. It was also a very efficient way to speak and to write. But, you know, for us today, th this just seems very strange. We're not used to it. At least not in these prophetic books. When we go to the Psalms, we're pretty familiar with it when we see it there. And we know how easy, tends to be easy, to memorize the, the verses of the Psalms because of that parallelism. Uh, so what's the point? What's the point of this? Well, the, the Lord used a style. He used a genre of communication that was very, very uh, vivid, very expressive. Um, it elicited emotion. Now, Israel, as they heard these messages, they didn't need to just hear it right away. Israel needed to feel these messages. And that's what this language helped to bring out, to actually feel the depth of the depravity and of the faithlessness and of the rejection of the God who loved them, who brought them to where they were. This language helped to feel that. So when it comes to you and me, guess what? 
We need to not just hear the word of God with our ears, hear the word of the Lord proclaimed. You also need to feel it. You need to feel it in your soul, to the depths of your being. God speaks to you. And maybe we can say this is one of the differences between preaching and teaching, although that can tend to be somewhat artificial. But there's always overlap between the two. But preaching has a tendency to aim for a response to the heart. There's a marked difference between preaching and teaching. Uh, and, and I would suspect that many traditions, early traditions, that may have been one of the reasons why um, pastors would sing their sermons and the liturgy would be done in, in song. I, I don't advocate that. Uh, I want people to come. Uh, but it was designed to feel that you're in the presence of God and, and that He is present with His people. It's one reason why singing aids that, to know that God is with us and we are feeling the truth as well as expressing the truth of God. Uh, now, as we've been working through Hosea, the, the main theme is, is constant. Uh, Jose, or Isaiah, excuse me, Israel has broken faith. They've been unfaithful. They've broken the covenant with their God. God is their husband. And it's just what happened between Gomer and Hosea. God wasn't just piling on as he sent Hosea to preach message after message after message, chronicling Israel's sinfulness. One message just wasn't sufficient. It's interesting in the ministry of Jonah to Assyria that would happen several several decades later. He just had a very simple message. Forty days and Assyria is gone. <laughs> Assyria is destroyed. That's the only thing he basically preached as far as we know. He may have said other things. But in all of these messages from Hosea, we see, do we not, the Lord's patience, the Lord's long-suffering, we see his forbearance as he bears with his people. And in that we see something of the heart of God. How he's likened to that of a husband like Hosea. He was betrayed by someone that he loved and someone that he cared for. We see that. We feel that. And his judgment is, is not so much out of anger as we think of anger. His judgment is certainly from righteous anger, anger and jealousy because the one that he loves is destroying herself. Of course, as Israel worshipped the Baals, as she corrupted the true worship of God, she was harming herself. And that's what you and I do. That's what we do when we stray from when we disobey our loving, compassionate Lord God, you spiritually harm yourself when you stray. And the Lord calls you back. You know, the best thing that can happen to you is to be captured, to be arrested, and changed by the power of Almighty God. Even as that may be very hurtful at times, Difficult. So Israel was rich. She had a very rich, majestic, glorious history. Jacob who started out as that deceiver, took advantage of his brother Esau. By the time he was famished, Stole his birthright, the claim to it, and then later on when he was out hunting, his father was going to lay the blessing upon him and the inheritance, and Jacob took advantage of his absence. But as I said, he met his match in Laban, his uncle. Laban was more skilled, he was more experienced 
at cheating and at swindling than was Jacob. And he was manipulated essentially into working for Laban as, 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 a, as a servant, a hired servant. Matter of fact, he would change his wages without telling Jacob. But through all of that, difficult as it was, the Lord God changed the heart of Jacob, that conniver, that swindler, that manipulator. His heart changed. Yeah, he still had some rough edges, but he learned to trust God. He learned to rely upon him. And surrounded by a multitude of idols as Jacob was, he came to embrace the one true and living God, the God of his father, Abraham and Isaac. And the covenant, God's gracious promise, became very precious to Jacob. Now with this rich history supporting Israel, you would think, would you not, that they would follow suit. But they didn't. They remained like Jacob before his encounter with God. Israel was still just a bunch of cheaters, liars, idolaters. Why does God tell us, we who are here today, why does God tell us this? Why does he give us all this detail? I think for one of the very simple reasons that we can be just like Israel. Because we too are very prone to forget what has gone before. We too are disposed to revert to the sins of our spiritual forebears before they were changed by Almighty God. We're no different than Israel. We forget. We revert to our sins, sins of our fathers. You know, we human beings, we have this distinct proclivity to ascribe any blessings that we get, just as Israel, to our own smarts, our own goodness, our own our own uh, imagination, whatever blessings, whatever successes, whatever victories. We credit ourselves, but our losses, our defeats, then we blame God. And we forget the history of God's work, not just in our own lives, but we forget how God has been at work in the lives of our ancestors the lives of all those upon whose shoulders we stand. We forget. Jacob, a very towering figure, should have been a, a monumental testament to the people of God, of God's goodness and of His mercy. But instead, they acted like Jacob before he was changed. Each of us today, one of the things we should be able to do is we should be able to identify, we should be able to put our finger on the grace, on the mercy of God as He's providentially been ordering events in our lives and in the lives of our physical and our spiritual ancestors. We should be able to see how God has been at work. And if we're not familiar with that, we should ask our nation, our people. We think as if we had the power that made ourselves rich and strong. Well, God in His judgment, in His justice, He's stripping us of our pride and our boasting, just as He did to Israel. You know, the hubris of mankind. That will never stand before the Lord. Pride is a stench in the nostrils of God. And so the time is now for us, the people of God, to humble ourselves, to seek the Lord, to seek His favor that perhaps He might turn from His judgment and His wrath against a nation such as ours, though not in covenant as such, as Israel was, 
But we have been a nation blessed with privileges and, and bounty, a divinely ordered history given truth. And yet we squander it. Notice in verse 14, the Lord repaid Ephraim for his disgraceful deeds. Will not the Lord do the same to us? This is the season to be jolly, right? I mean, what a great message God has given to us as people. That true peace can be had. True peace. Peace in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace that never ends. Peace that is real. And the time for remembering the Prince of Peace came into the world. That he was born of very low circumstances. Very low circumstances. Born of the of the Virgin Mary, the one who came to save his people from their sins, to open up righteousness, peace, and joy. That's a great message of hope for all the world to hear. It ought to be on our tongue all the time. But you know, before that message can have any context, any real meaning, the hard messages of Hosea that he preached in his passage have to be proclaimed. Israel failed to learn from her history. But it was a great history. A divinely ordered history. They learned. They should have learned what covenant faithful was as their forefather Jacob did, but they didn't. Israel repudiated her history. She repudiated her God. She incurred guilt through Baal. She died. The message of hope and comfort, it's still, it's coming in Hosea. It's there. But the time was not yet ripe for Israel to hear it. But I hope the time is right for you to hear the message of hope. Because you have come to understand the divinely ordered history of the Lord in your life. You have come to understand the scope of your spiritual failure and inability before God. I hope the time is ripe. And if you've forgotten or maybe you've never understood how God has divinely ordered your history. Understand this, that God has planned for you this day to hear about Israel and her failures. And Almighty God was patient with a terribly wicked and stubborn people. And Almighty God is patient with you also. Stop any vain quest for pursuits that were are like pursuing the wind. They'll never satisfy. The true riches do not come from your hands. The true riches are in Christ. They're in Christ and in Christ alone. He who is the Prince of Peace, Lord of Lords, and King of Kings. O oh, holy and sovereign God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are the only true fountain of blessing. And yet we, just as Israel, we're prone to wander. We're prone to leave the God that we claim we love. So may Christ, may Christ alone be our passion and our pursuit. Oh, may remove from us lies. And deceit. May we, may we seek and know truth as it is only in Christ Jesus. And so today as we come to your table of remembrance, let us remember, let us trust alone, 
what our Savior has accomplished, he by whom Hosea spoke, and in whom alone we have life. Through Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing about that truth. It's in Christ alone that our hope is found.